was my volume good for everyone? All right, well, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. My name is Allison Wendland. I'm the case manager for this proposal with Jefferson County. Um, as you can see on the screen, you have my information there. A, a very small stack of cards if you'd like one, but if not, um, I'll have my information on the screen at the end. So tonight, uh, my main purpose for being here is to talk with you all a little bit, um, give you an idea of the process involved with a rezoning. Um, so I just have a brief presentation to start, and then I'll pass it on uh, to the applicants here to discuss the actual proposal. So if you have questions after I speak about the actual process involved, um, that's what I can help with, and then any questions on the actual proposal or the development, I'll have you hold off until after their presentation. So a couple things I'll cover this evening. Um, I'm going to go over the steps in the process to getting something like this approved, or getting it at least to the hearing stage for a decision. I'm going to talk a little bit about public input and how um, the best way for you to get your questions and concerns addressed. I'll talk a little bit about the staff evaluation of the proposal and, and what staff's position is on this request. And then last, we'll just briefly talk about the hearing process and how a decision is ultimately made. So on the screen, you'll see uh, we're currently in the second step of the community meeting. So a lot of the questions I get um, at this point is, you know, how far along is this? How is this the sure thing? And we're very early in the process still. So the first step in a proposal to rezone a piece of land in unincorporated Jefferson County is that the applicant will have a pre-application meeting with staff. Um, this isn't a public process, this is just an initial meeting with staff to bring up their proposal, their idea, to get an understanding of generally what the county um, feels about the request. We, at this time, we send it out on what we call a referral to different agencies within the county, so that might include the fire district, or it did include the fire district, public health, transportation and engineering, to get their initial concerns and feedback. Um, so that way we can give that to the applicant and they can have an idea of what they're going to be facing moving forward. So again, the next step is the community meeting, which you are all here this evening. Um, this is a really important step in the process and I really appreciate everyone coming out. This is the, your first chance to ask any questions about the proposal you have. Um, and uh, bring up any concerns that you have with the proposal. By doing the community meeting so early in the process, it allows the applicant to listen to those concerns and questions you might have and potentially change their proposal or address those concerns before the formal application. Um, this isn't your only opportunity for public input, it's simply the first. So um, don't be worried that if you're not heard this evening or um, something isn't addressed tonight that you won't have an opportunity as you go through the process. So after the community meeting, the next step would be that the applicant uh, submit for a formal rezoning application to the county. This is the, this is the process where they submit and we start getting them to the point where they go to hearing for a decision. At the time of the formal rezoning, they're going to be required to submit a lot more than they did at the initial pre-application um, meeting. This is where they would submit things like a traffic study, um, more, um, I guess, robust plans of what they'd like to do. The rezoning process is a public process. Um, much like you were notified for this process, and you may have seen the large yellow signs on the property, You'll see that again after they submit for their formal application. Um, one thing I'll mention that confuses a lot of people when they're trying to follow a case is that with each step in the process, a new case number is assigned. So there was a case number for the pre-application, then there'll be a case number for the community meeting, and then there's a case number for the rezoning. Um, and that's simply because Oftentimes, a lot of development doesn't move past the, that first step, and so we assign a new case number or um, cases can have their pre-application in one year and two years later they move forward. So it's always a new case number, so you can always keep an eye out for those signs. The updated case numbers will be um, on the postcards and everything. You can always also just search by the address of the site. 
um, on our website, or you can give me a call and ask what the status of the application is, and I'm happy to give you the updated case number. So as I said, the rezoning is a formal process, um, a public process, and so throughout that, you have the opportunity to comment. There won't be a forum like this, a community meeting forum at the time of the um, formal rezoning, but what you can do is send me letters, send me emails, or call and talk with me over the phone about your concerns or comments. Anytime you do that, those comments are put into the official case file. Um, staff uses those comments for their staff report, and the Planning Commission as well as the Board of County Commissioners will see um, those, that file full of all the comments we've received on the case. So after the rezoning process, which includes those same referral type processes that I talked about with the pre-application, um, eventually it'll get to the point where the applicant is ready to go to hearing. So they start their first hearing with the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission is a, a board of appointed members. Um, and what they do is they make a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners. Then you have the Board of County Commissioners hearing. And if the rezoning is approved, then we would move on with the next step. If the rezoning is denied, then the applicant needs to go back to kind of square one on that. So if the rezoning is approved, we move on to what's called the site development plan process. This is also a public process, however, it, it doesn't go to hearing. Um, the site development plan is when, when staff actually reviews the, the physical development on site. So the grading work that would be done, the architecture of the buildings, the landscaping requirements, um, all of those kind of physical um, components of the development. This is a much less subjective process because we do have strict land development regulations that have to be met with each new development. And so this is more of a matter of meeting the requirements, meeting you know everything, the parking requirements, all of that. Once staff feels that that is uh, adequate and the site development plan is approved, then the applicant can start with their building permits, grading permits and building permits to actually break ground. <coughs> so timeline on all of that, if we're being realistic, could take up to a year to get through all of these processes. The rezoning can take several months, um, as well as the site development plan. It, it often just depends on how quickly the applicant is moving. Okay? So next, I'll just briefly talk about public input. Um, as many of, many of you probably were notified with a postcard, um, if you're within a 500-foot buffer area of the uh, property. Now, you may see in our regulations that it states a quarter mile notification, but there is a caveat to that where if that quarter mile buffer list results in more than 50 individual homeowners, then we step it down to the 500 foot. So in this case, we did notify a 500 foot bu buffer of the property, but we also do post the, the property as well. Um, and so the next question I often get is, you know, <coughs> by my being here tonight, what is that going to do? How are my comments and concerns going to be addressed? Um, as I talked about earlier, it's really your opportunity to talk with the developer themselves so they have an understanding moving through this process, which is a public process, of what your concerns are because the Planning Commission will listen to your concerns and the Board of County Commissioners will as well. And so we like to have you here up front so the developer understands what the concerns of the community are. And on the screen, you'll see a link to our website. Um, I don't know. did. How many of you found information on our website regarding this proposal? Okay. It can be difficult, I will admit that. <laughs> so I'll kind of talk you through how, how you can do that. If you go to our, our home page, <laughs> so if you just remember jeffco.us forward slash planning and zoning, if you get to there, on our main page, the top little link on it says active case search. You just click on that, and if you have the case number or the address, you can enter that in, you can click search, and it'll bring up all relevant cases to that address. And in there, it's an electronic case file, so you can find anything that's submitted to the county regarding this case is put onto that electronic case file. 
So that means if you submit comments to me that you want part of the formal case file, they will be in there for public public view and public record. What process are you using for this one? We're using uh, it's 13034 South US Highway 85. 285. Absolutely. One, three, zero, three, four, six, south, U.S. Highway 285. Okay. So I'll just briefly talk about uh, staff evaluation on a project like this. Um, if you go into the pre-application case file, um, on our website, you'll probably see a document that I prepared originally as the case manager that stated that staff generally supports this proposal. And the reason for that, the main component that we look at, is what the community plan and the comprehensive master plan for Jefferson County recommend for that property. So currently the property is zoned agricultural. Uh, the, the main designation of land use in the community plan is residential. However, in the comprehensive master plan, there is a specific area that talks about um, retreats and those sort of resort retreat communities and where those are located. Now, in any residential zone district, Jefferson County has made the determination that a retreat center is a compatible land use and can be um, advised to be located on that property. Um, I'll mention that the community, or the community plans and the comprehensive master plans are advisory. It's not a hard and fast, that's absolutely what's going to go there, but it's what staff uses when developing, or excuse me, when evaluating a proposal. We have to have something, um, a long range type plan to understand the county as a whole and where we would want to locate these things when someone is looking to develop it. So that's the main reason um, that at the pre-application phase, we recommended general staff support for it. It doesn't mean that staff supports every item that's listed. Um, it doesn't mean we are accepting the height or, or every detail of it. It's just a general land use recommendation that the plan supports. And I talked briefly before about the referral process. Oftentimes people are concerned that the fire district isn't aware or the transportation department isn't aware. With any of these processes, they go through that referral process, which um, gets sent out to all those agencies. They send comments back to the case manager. We compile those and give them to the applicant. So last, after we get through that whole process, we get to, which I talked about a little bit earlier, the Planning Commission hearing, who makes their recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners, and then the ultimate Board of County Commissioners hearing. So ultimately, even though staff makes recommendations on it, um, the Planning Commission makes their recommendation, your elected Board of County Commissioners would make the final decision on approval. So, it's a lot of, somewhat boring planner talk. Um, does anybody have questions about the general process for rezoning a piece of land? Yeah. This is a little bit broader, but it's still a process question. If something like this were approved and built and then they wanted to expand it, would they go back and go through, not the rezoning process, obviously, but all of these other steps again? Yeah, so if, if the land use, um, say they're proposing a, a large addition onto one of the structures, it's still that same land use, it wouldn't require a rezoning process, but um, the site development plan is triggered by an addition of 400 square feet or larger. So any, you know, if they're doing a small addition, if they're doing interior renovations, that wouldn't trigger the site development plan. However, a large addition uh, would require that. Um, and then so we would review again their parking to make sure that this new addition is still served by an adequate amount of parking, landscaping, architecture, all of that would be reviewed. And that again is a public process for comments, but it does not go to a public hearing for decision. Yeah. So this might be a little 
little too specific, but right now it's zone A2. What is the zoning going to be changed to? Um, I'll probably let uh, the applicants talk a little bit about that. As far as our discussions at the pre-application meeting, it will be zoned to something called a planned development. And that's mainly because this is a very specific use that doesn't fall under one of our standard zone districts. And so you can think of a planned development as kind of a tailored, customized zoning. Um, the applicant originally comes up with it, but staff reviews it and we kind of have to buy into everything they're proposing. Any other questions? All right, that was a lot easier than my Tuesday night meeting, where I had about 500 questions, so thanks for coming. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Parsons. I'm the uh, CFO of the Archdiocese of Denver, as well as I'm also the president of Camp St. Malo Retreat and Conference Center. Um, Camp St. Malo, the reason that that's important and I wanted to bring it up today in my role in that, is that this uh, re proposed retreat center that we're going to talk about tonight will operate under uh, that entity of Camp St. Malo. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I sincerely want to say I do want to hear you know, your comments, questions, feedback. The whole team does. Um, so you know, I appreciate the time and effort that you've taken to come out tonight to, to hear about what we're, what we're talking about here. I thought I'd start off with some introductions of the team that we've brought. Um, so in addition to myself, um, at the end, on my right, is uh, Deacon Bob Hoffman. He runs the planning and construction group of the Archdiocese. Next to him is Lou Bishop. She's responsible for the real estate division of our archdiocese. Um, I'll come back to you, Bob. Um, and then we, we, we do have one, we have one more archdiocesan employee, so I figured I'd go with him. Michael Six. Um, Michael Six is actually the director of Camp St. Malo, so he'd be responsible for the operations of this new retreat center. And now uh, we also have brought along uh, Edos Architects, uh, Bob Sauce uh, is with Edos Architects, as well as Jonathan Rosenthal behind me here. And then the last person I want to introduce is uh, a gentleman named Mike Meyer, who's with uh, the uh, legal firm of Lewis, Roca, and Rothger Rothgerber. So when I started off here, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of, of why we're here today. Uh, from, a, from an archdiocesan perspective. So as I've mentioned before, Camp St. Malo, we have a, a location um, which was previously for retreats um, located in Boulder County um, up in Allen's Park, uh, Colorado, uh, called Camp St. Malo. That facility, the retreat center, was built in 1987, or started operations in 1987. Um, we had a chapel there at that location since the 1930s, so we've been in that location for a long period of time. But in 1987, we built a retreat center. Um, in 1993, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Pope John Paul II at the time, now Saint John Paul II, um, visit that, that location up at Camp St. Malo. So it's a, it's a very well-known site, very historic site up there. Um, unfortunately, in November of 2011, um, we had a fire that hit the retreat center itself um, and burnt down about half the retreat center. Um, two years after that, uh, Mount Meeker was nice enough to dump a huge mudslide down that lo into that location, basically wiping out you know, a lot of the area um, that we owned uh, around that, in that Allen's Park location. Um, as a result, we've, we've done studies around that location. That was in <laughs> September of 2013. Um, we've done studies there and it's, we've determined that it's just unstable and we cannot do any further redevelopment of that area of our camp and our retreat center in that location. So therefore, in, in about that time, we've, we determined to start looking for, for alternative locations. And in January of uh, 2015, here we put an offer on the Crow Ranch property that we're going to talk about tonight and then closed on that in May of, of 2015. Um, you know, Camp St. Malo, just to give you a quick background, that our, our mission is really to have retreats that provide inspirational settings for adult and youth retreats, basically. Um, so that, you know, what, what we're looking for here is a, is a night, what you guys love about this area, which is it's, it's quiet, it's serene, um, it's, it's, you know, it's inspirational. So we have religious and you know, spiritual retreats in that location. 
Um, at this point, what I want to do is I want to turn it over to, to Michael Six, who I introduced earlier, so he could tell you a little bit about himself, because he's actually going to be doing a lot of the on-the-ground um, you know, legwork around this project. Thank you, Keith. As Keith mentioned, my name is Michael Six, and everybody asks, how do you spell that? It's S-I-X. <laughs> and people still get it wrong. <laughs> Uh, and I've just arrived uh, a week ago from Pennsylvania. Um, one of the things that I've did in Pennsylvania is run a retreat center for several years, among a number of other things. So I do have some experience in, in doing this kind of work. Um, and I know that there are a lot of different uh, questions and concerns, especially among people who haven't been to retreat centers before and don't quite understand uh, the, the operation. So just to give you just a, a little bit of, a, of an idea, um, uh, retreat centers, um, usually have uh, small groups that come, uh, maybe a parish group, we'll bring uh, 30 or 40 people from the parish for our, a few days to have a, a time to get away, get away from all of the, uh, the rush of life, get away from the problems and the difficulties, and be able to, to charge the batteries again. You know, in the military, retreat is different from a rout. <laughs> it's different from, <laughs> from losing the battle. You retreat, you pull back in order to regroup. So as you go back out and fight again. And we find that in our lives, we need to do that ourselves, too. We need that time to, to sit back, to quiet down, to reorganize ourselves, and to, to get back to uh, what we thought was our purpose that we just kind of kind of lost along the way sometimes. So this is the idea behind the retreat, to, to pull away. And that's why you go to a quiet place, a place with great natural beauty, where you can be quiet and quiet your soul down, your heart and your mind down, and to be able to, to get ready to go back and to go and, and fight the good fight. So we'll do this with, a, with say, a parish group, or maybe that we have a, a speaker coming in uh, who's going to be leading retreat, and there may be people who come from several different parishes to come for that retreat. Uh, also, we'll do, uh, once we have a, a building suitable for our uh, youth retreats, uh, quite often what will happen is you'll have the junior class from the high school will come out for several days, typically during the middle of the week, during the you know, regular school day times, with their teachers, with some um, extra adults, some parents, uh, and they will have a, uh, a youth-centered retreat, doing the same sort of things on a slightly different level because they're, they're youth and they're adults and, and someone in a different manner. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about too is um, a few little places we'll have for our individuals to have individual time. Uh, sometimes it doesn't fit into your schedule or uh, the way that you need to, to uh, work on your own spiritual life to join a, a larger group. And so you might want to have time where you just are very quietly on your own doing a private retreat. So we have, we'll have a small facility where an individual could come out and have a maybe a week where they would uh, meet usually once a day with a spiritual director and have quiet time on their own. They have their own reading they want to do. They have their meditations they want to do. They have their walks that they want to do during the day, say. Uh, so we do have a little bit of an opportunity to do a small number of individual people that way. The, um, the retreat centers um, do have a, a relatively small staff. Uh, you are trying to feed people. You are trying to house them, so you have to have somebody there to do the laundry and to change the beds. Um, some of the, uh, the staff uh, may be volunteer staff, but they would also be some, uh, some paid staff. We have some people who uh, actually run the, the uh, program portion of the retreat, so there might be one or two people who would be doing the, the schedule and giving talks. Uh, Priests come out to say mass or have uh, devotions. So there's a fairly small staff. You have a maintenance person or two to, uh, to take care of all those little leaks and problems that, uh, that happen during the week. And, uh, light bulbs that need to be changed. Um, so it's, it's a fairly small uh, staff that, that, uh, that runs the retreat centers, but usually the groups that are coming for a retreat are bringing, uh, quite often bringing their own, if not program people, certainly bringing their own um, organizers or with the youth retreats, bringing the, the, their own chaperones and teachers. <coughs> yes? When you say small staff, could you elaborate about how many people you're talking about that? It's, it's somewhat hard to say at this point, um, but you know, typically you, you've got to have, you know, if you're doing 
three meals a day, you've got to have a couple of cooks. So you probably have a uh, head cook and a couple of assistant cooks. And there's a dishwasher, and you have a uh, head housekeeper, and you might have several part-time uh, housekeepers or possibly you know, volunteers who help with that. And yeah, the maintenance, you know, probably one or two maintenance people. <coughs> Will there be any other type of events, like weddings or anything like that, Well, we do have a, a chapel. It's a Catholic chapel, and we expect to do things that are done in Catholic chapels. So, you know, weddings could be, could be done there. Is this a 12 month year inspiration? The hope is to be able to run 12 months a year. Uh, there may be times when we just say, you know, does things planned this weekend are canceled. And we've had that, had that happen. I know you've had that too. Are there any plans for troubled kids retreats? We don't have any specific plans for troubled kids. Um, you know, the uh, the groups that generally come out with the youth groups are you know, like a, a school class or it might be a parish a youth group that we come out, with. and they always come with their uh, their own supervision, uh, both the uh, teachers uh, and chaperones, and the diocese does have regulations on the. Percentages of, of students to chaperones for our uh, overnight trips. Yes. Will groups with other than those associated with the church be able to rent the facilities? That is a, is a possibility. Um, you know, there are certain restrictions that we always have. Um, you know, the, uh, the use of the chapel is, is generally restricted to, to Catholic activities um, uh, or, or those that uh, are very similar in nature. Um, and that's um, it's designed as a uh, as an archdiocesan retreat center. So the, the the primary reason is for Catholic retreats. That being said, it's uh, it's not precluded that we couldn't have uh, the, the Methodists coming in doing their retreat. So there are a number of possibilities there, but it's primarily it's a, it's a Catholic retreat center. Um, what's the average event you would have, like say in a month? The average is a little hard to say. I mean, you'd, you'd like to have the place, uh, you know, pretty active. Generally, weekends are the times that most people are, are able to get away. So the retreat groups coming from parishes typically are retreat are weekend groups. The schools, on the other hand, tend to do more um, weekday, where their staff is already expected to be working on the weeks, on the weekdays. So it's, it's a lot easier for them to take time off. During, uh, during school for that rather than doing the, the weekends. Well, what's the percentage of Camp St. Michael? What's the percentage of time it's filled and being used? Versus uh, unfortunately, they're, they're quite often quite, quite quiet. <laughs> there are a lot of days when, when there's nobody other than a couple of staff members around and you hear the crickets. But uh, in terms of the numbers, I'm not sure you know, just what the, the particular numbers are. And this is a different place. Uh, it's going to be a different situation, so it's going to be hard, a little hard to say at this point. Based on the proposed plan, <coughs> what is the maximum number of people at an event you would anticipate? I think we'll, we'll get into that a little later on and talk about the, the particular facilities and once we get into that section. Michael, let's kick it over. Do we want to go that direction now? Yeah, let's. Okay, let's off, off. Sure. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Bob Sass. I'm an architect for Eos Architects, and this is John Rosenthal, who's also uh, one of my business partners as well as uh, an architect. Uh, with EOS Architects, and we're very pleased to be a, a part of this whole um, project for the Archdiocese. Um, I would first of all just like to uh, start out with giving you, not to avoid your question, <laughs> but I'd like to uh, start out by kind of giving you um, some some background about um, what we what we've accomplished so far, and and that is essentially to. Um, work with the archdiocese to identify um, how this how this potential piece of property could be developed, and we're just in that infancy portion of the project. 
Um, as um, Allison has indicated, you know, we're in the infancy of, of developing or rezoning um, and, and taking it potentially all the way through construction drawings and building something. But we haven't designed anything yet. We've just began or begun to study the site itself, um, where potential roads can go, where potential buildings can go, where it makes sense in terms of drilling wells, all of those kinds of things. So we're in a very investigative portion of the development of this property. And again, that's why it's helpful that you know we're talking with all of you this evening. So first of all, what I'd like to do is, uh, it's tough when you're left-handed. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, this, this is the exit off of 285 up here. Uh, the quarries up here, and then across um, the highway is the, the trout pond, just to kind of give you uh, some sense of uh, location. The school is located down in here, and then this is uh, South Elk Creek Road uh, coming down um, the side of the site. There's a big open meadow. Um, there's a, a little a creek that runs down this area, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the pond uh, that's located in this area. And, uh, and this red line that goes around here is the property uh, that the Archdiocese has purchased, which is approximately 247 acres. John, you want So consequently, um, what we are we're investigating is what makes the most sense to develop a very quiet retreat component for the Archdiocese. And so we walked the entire site. My knees still hurt. <laughs> uh, and, and so consequently, we've, we've really kind of settled down on this portion of the site. Um, up, in, up in this area, well, there's it's a lot of hilly terrain. Uh, we've identified the Lion's Head um, viewing shelter because that's the highest point on the site. Uh, and, and again, in terms of what the, what the Archdiocese is looking for with a, a quiet, reflective space, we've kind of focused down in this area because, because it is a very quiet and reflective area. So consequently, as another point of reference, there's an existing cabin that's right next to that pond. The only access point right now is a gated um, uh, driveway that comes off of Elk Creek Road um, and sort of kind of goes over the creek, um, or it used to. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, this is the only access way right now into the site in this location. And uh, as I'm sure all of you are aware, or most of you anyway, that, uh, that little bridge is in tough shape and we can't cross it any longer. So one of the things that we started looking at and investigating was just exactly how we could start to access the site, where it made some sense in terms of an area that we felt uh, really could be well developed. And so the first thing that we did is looked at a logical place to build a road and keep Allison's buddies happy. And, and so, we wanted to line something up with uh, South Cedar Circle uh, in reference to um, working with the county and what made the most logical sense with traffic. And so consequently, this is, a, this is an excellent place for us uh, to create an intersection and redevelop that intersection for safety um, as, 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 as we start to develop the site. We then will come across here. We might build a little better bridge. Um, <laughs> than the one that's there now. And that will take us up into this little uh, natural draw. Um, our engineers so far have suggested that this route coming into the site seems to be the most logical uh, in terms of least disruptive um, to the natural grade, to the natural environment, in order to get, to get us back into the main area of development, which is located here, uh, where we're suggesting an adult retreat center, a chapel, as well as a youth retreat center. And this gray blob in here 
is um, essentially planned for a parking lot. And I'm not sure if any of you have ever had the opportunity to be up on that site, but where that parking lot is located, there's a very deep swale right in there. It's fairly flat ground in this area. So you look up from Elk Creek Road up the hill in the trees, um, and then this swoops down. So all of our parking is going to be in this dipped area. So, um, so where cars are moving around with their headlights, they're going to actually be um, they're, they're going to be buried into the side of the hill, as well as the trees. The other thing I'd like to point out is, uh, as we come up into this area, you'll notice that we've got uh, a domestic fire tank up here, domestic water and fire flow tank. Um, at this time, um, we are with the with the size of the buildings that we are investigating. Um, this will be a fairly <laughs> sizable tank. 250 to 300,000 gallons worth of water that will be um, utilized as um, um, essentially protective water for this whole area. In, a, in addition to that, um, we also have um, some very small little buildings, which are small hermitages, um, which um, will only be about 400 square foot facilities, one, one or two person occupancy a small camping area for about 60 people. Um, and so uh, that, that, this is essentially the extent, oh, and then there's, there's my favorite building, the sewage treatment building, right down in here, which will look like one of the other buildings. And then we'll be, we will be building a, um, uh, a leach field down into this area, a long, long ways away on the other side of the hill from where the water supply comes in. And this is the area where we intend to be drilling the wells uh, at, at this particular time for, for the facility. Um, we have one way in, and we will have a second way out, but we're still investigating um, where that's going to be. Um, there's some steep grades in this area. We're in the process of surveying that site, this area right now, to figure out the best way to um, create a secondary e e exit off of the site for fire purposes. Um, with regard to that, there will only be one means of entrance and egress that will be utilized on a, on a regular basis. That second means of egress is for emergency purposes only, and it will only be utilized by the fire department, as well as the guy plowing the snow, because we've got to keep it cleaned up. So the only time that thing's going to be open is if there's an emergency. Um, so there won't be additional traffic um, coming off of that secondary coming off of that secondary exit. The other thing I did want to point out is that we also met with the fire chief um, uh, um, from the Elk Creek Fire District, Chief McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Um, and uh, he had, uh, had some concerns that he, he shared with us. Um, and as we went through this, we were trying to work with him and try and understand what um, you know, just exactly how this whole thing could come together just as we're meeting with you this evening. Uh, one of the things that he's concerned with is that, you know, uh, as, as, a, as a potential fire comes uh, and winds come through that draw down in this area, um, it's going to open up right into this mouth. One of the things that he thought was a, a, a wonderful situation is with this domestic fire flow water up here that doesn't exist today if a disaster would happen down farther and it would start blowing up that creek, we would, we would have some, some fire protection that doesn't exist today. Secondly, he is looking, he was, he's always looking for a safe zone. If, if, the, if the area gets into a, a very, very difficult situation, where, where, would, where, where a safe zone could be established. This parking lot right in here, he was very interested in being part of the design process for that parking lot and create and making sure that we've got sprinklers in that area, that uh, the plant material um, is, 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 a, is, a, is a ways away. What, was, what did you say, John? Uh, non combustible plant material. So, like the ponderosa pines are typically very combustible. So, if we, right now that area is kind of clear, um, there's not a lot of vegetation there. So, if we plant something, it could be something more like an aspen, which are harder to burn. Uh, quite a bit harder to burn. Um, and you know, 
kind of, kind of the way we beautify the site with our landscaping restrictions, we want to be, he's going to make us be conscious of, you know, how we develop that. And so, so consequently, um, we create the safe zone, and then the final part of it is, uh, in terms of uh, the size of the parking lot that we'd like to develop, um, he was encouraging us to make it large enough for a helipad, so if there is a, is a disaster that happens, we can evacuate people from that location um, to help out the whole valley area in here. So um, uh, essentially what we're trying to do is um, look for a place, again, for a quiet retreat and, create, and, and help create a safe environment for not only the people retreating, um, but also for the, for the entire community. Yes, sir. So I'm curious on your parking lot, what, uh, what kind of nice type of caution are you taking with that? Well, well, we will certainly um, be designing according to county standards in terms of night sky. So we can't go up any higher than 15 or 16 feet for the pole. All, all of the light will be broadcast down. Um, as I had mentioned before, the natural grade is such where it dips down in such a manner so um, the lights from this area are going to be extremely difficult to see anything from down below because of that, because of that deep swale where we intend to put the park. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. So, on your plans, you don't have anything indicated as to how the existing house is going to be used, what are the plans for that? Um, and I have a question to uh, Michael? Or, or. Yeah, sorry. Um, the exi existing house, it's on. Um, there's two houses. I, I, there's the one that's right off the road, and then there's one down um, in the low of this existing cabin area. Um, Initially, it'll probably be uh, converted to an office space where, where Michael will be able to, to you know, keep his operations. Um, we'll, we'll determine you know, long-term use of what that is, but initially it's going to be an operations location. My second question is on the map. Um, there's some thin red lines running through. I'm assuming that those are hiking trails. Um, and I don't know if there's any other information about that. Is that something that you will be taking the hiking trail out of the metal along the front of the road? Uh, yeah, that, that's how we have it drawn on this on this current plan. That's correct. It runs right in front of the pond. I don't think for that. As with the hiking trails here, um, there hasn't been a, a lot of thought into where those hiking trails actually are going to be. We just had to represent them for the rezoning. So Jefferson County has an idea of what we want to do. <laughs> um, there will be much more thought put into that during the site development process, and we'll take in comments and everything like that. And how we design that. Yes. I want to keep going. Related to the hiking trails, I saw um, in your documents that were online um, some reference to the fact that the hiking trails would be open to the public. And so I want to piggyback on the question that was asked earlier about a person who's not necessarily affiliated with the church or the facilities. Yeah, just to, to clarify that a little bit. Um, yeah, the idea is, is not to have a, a public parking lot and here is the trailhead, come here to hike. Uh, the idea is that um, as, we, as we work with, with uh, people in the neighborhood, uh, and, and by the way, um, uh, at least one day a week, I think it's at this point gonna be like Wednesday morning, I'll be at DW's having breakfast. So if anybody has to come and talk to me, <laughs> I'd love to meet everybody and get you to see. But the idea that is that uh, uh, depending on what is going on in the retreat center, there are times when uh, it's it's uh, not a problem to have neighbors come by, and uh, the retreat center used to work at me. We have people who walk their dogs around, they get their exercise around the trails. So it's possible to do that. It's on a um, uh, discretion of the, of the director's kind of basis, though. So if you're interested in something like that, you come see me and talk and say, hey, I'd like to come by Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Is it okay? Right, are we back to program now, or are we back to design? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. That's a great question. I don't have to answer it at this stage of the game. What has to happen at this stage, we, we need to do a minor traffic study. 
um, in terms of the amount of traffic that's coming in and out of here, um, to, to identify the diff how, how sophisticated that intersection is going to get, what the requirements are based on the amount of traffic. Um, and uh, the county um, will determine that after we do a traffic count. Um, right now, we're anticipating a very low traffic count and, and, and how we're going back and forth between what's on the street as well as what, what's anticipated. So for that will help determine, I, I'd love to tell you that, but I'm not sure what the requirements are going to be yet. Yes, ma'am. Um, those of us who have been living near Georgia Mall for a long time, um, we've seen this We're both left-handed, by the way, so you know, we have a lot of um, I think the, the, the thought in my mind is you have a campfire area so, you know, to get in a city in an area that's controlled. You don't have, uh, you know, go out where you would want and, and have your campfire. But, but camping, yeah, with a campfire. And whatever, you know, the regulations that the county has would certainly be fine. Could I get an answer to my question from earlier, please? As to how many people you anticipate based on your current drawings at oh. any one time? Well, at any one time it can vary, but I can tell you what capacities are in terms of what would, would that be helpful because, I mean, we may have a few here, a few there, and, I, and there's always a possibility of filling the whole thing up. But uh, we're, we're, we have 60 rooms, um, single occupancy rooms, so you know, you could, I suppose, you could have up to 120 people based on that. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the chapel uh, will seat 160 people. Um, the, re the, the adult, uh, the, the youth retreat uh, will have uh, five bunk areas for 16 people. So we're, we're with some adult supervision, so about 100 people uh, in this. And we've identified about 60 campers right in here. The, uh, for, the, for the yurts that are down in this area. And then the, uh, uh, then the uh, permit ditches are essentially just one, little, one bedroom small component, so you have one or two people in there, uh, max. That's all it's gonna be able to, to hold. So that's the, that's the occupancy components of the building besides staff, uh, in terms of what would be anticipated. Yes? Based on that occupancy and the fire protection, how many wells do you anticipate growing? We will probably have two, only for the sake of redundancy. The permit has been applied for the first well, which we have yet to drill and, and test to see what our production is. But as a matter of course, we ordinarily have a second well so that there's always the supply. Is that help? Yeah. Uh, a follow-up question. Do you anticipate having a generator or backup power to run the wells in case of a fire or power outages? I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. We will, yes, we're, we're, we're intending that to, to be the case as part of this uh, situation based on Camp St. Bottle's recent history. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Seems like the traffic count on Elk Creek Road is irrelevant. Your traffic count needs to be up at uh, Shaper's Crossing on Friday evening and Sunday evening. Between Shaper's Crossing and the Bucks and Bucks. Yeah. And, and, and just a quick comment about that. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that, that, that I'll be doing is I get promotional materials ready to go to our parishes and schools and, and other entities is I'm going to be strongly encouraging people to carpool. The uh, school groups will probably be coming up in school buses and vans. Um, as far as the, uh, the people leaving, generally at the end of a weekend, weekend retreat, um, they want to get out before brunch. So it's probably late morning on a Sunday, typically, where they'd be leaving. Um, I know Friday coming in is going to be the problem. 
Um, and typically, people will take off the day or half the day, so the cars coming in are over a long period of time there. And, and I don't really anticipate a huge number of cars compared to the, the current traffic. Yes, sir. So with uh, approximately 500 people there at uh, full maximum hospital. Wow. <laughs> I don't, I don't, yeah, what's if that happened once a year, I would be really impressed. What's the planner's um, plan if our wells downstream from there, our water pump goes down, given multiple wells being drilled? If we're operating off water that we purchased, um, the majority of water under a decree issued in 2007, including augmentation water, so to the extent we deplete any supply, it will go back into the system. Uh, but we're not taking water that we haven't acquired and purchased the right to use. Okay, and, and that's probably one of the biggest concerns with a lot of people, I think, is the water downstream. Well, you know, our we, have, uh, we have the first property where the creek runs onto after this property. Mm -hmm. And we're just concerned that our well of output is going to go down and a lot of people are like Okay. You know, I have a vague recollection. I don't know how big an area, but our engineers had sort of surveyed the, the permitted capacity on wells in an extensive area surrounding this. And they looked like they had uh, exceptional capacity and were producing now, in reasonable wells. amounts. Okay, and those wells being spaced pretty close to each other, what's the possibility of spreading things out and taking it from different aqueducts on the property possibly to diminish the downstream uh, uh, loss of water? That's something that we haven't addressed with our engineers yet. They're, they're looking for the first punch. Um, first of all, to see what their production is. You purchased water rights with the property, did you not? We have ditch rights. Ditch rights and the right to the pond with the property. In addition to that, we purchased decreed water rights and augmentation water. How many acre feet? 1.58, I think. I, I'm. 1.58 acre feet? I think. I don't, please don't quote me. I don't have the figures in front of me. It, it's a goodly supply. Yeah, I'll just add something from the county's point of view as well. If, if anyone has. Um, other concerns about the water, I recommend um, working or calling the county and talking with Pat O'Connell. Um, he's the county geologist, so at the time of the rezoning, they will be required to submit all of their water plans, um, how they're acquiring water. All of that is reviewed by our county geologist who's worked for the county for, gosh, I think Pat's been there 15 years, and you know reviews these sorts of proposals, so that might be another point of contact with your questions as well. So many hands. <laughs> sir, yes, you're on the end. Yes, sir. Yeah. My name's Kim Forsyth, and for the last 30 years, I've run the largest real estate appraisal company in the nation. And we get involved in doing highest and best use studies on projects like this all across the country. And when we moved here two years ago, I was really concerned about this property because you know Denver's now the hottest growing real estate market in the nation and there's going to be more and more pressure in the and I was so relieved that it was fought in the past but the highest best use is going to be high density residential and and they beat it once but I was concerned in the future I guess this is like a dream from the appraisal standpoint With, with retreats is that part of the mission statement is always respecting the land, stewardship. I, I'm just so happy because the wrong use would have affected all of our values. I think this is perfect. So I know there's a lot of moving parts that we'll all be involved in, but I just, that's our experience. So thanks. From an appraiser standpoint though, is that going to increase, decrease our house values? Yeah, it, you know, it suddenly, there's going to be a population that's aware of how beautiful Elk Creek is as they're exposed to it. So, you know, to us, it would go up. That's what we would say. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have two things.
Please, first and answer your question. I'm Carolyn Parnes, and I've been selling real estate up here for 25 years. I truly don't believe it's going to affect land values and home values at all, either way. I don't think it's going to make you know our values higher, but I definitely don't think it's going to lower them. Um, and that's just you know from the professional point of view. <laughs> My other question is the water rights. The water rights that the Ron Lewis family initially owned when they had that property. Does the Lewis family still have those water rights, or do they part of what the purchase? They still have some. So when he was foreclosed on, he was able to keep the water rights? <laughs> this property was not actually foreclosed. It had started under foreclosure, but it was settled out in the community. Well, how was he able to keep the water rights when he no longer I'm not sure there's some question that we can answer. <laughs> you made a question over here, sir. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. At your uh, previous facility, was it ever determined what the cause of the fire was? And so can you share that with us? It was in the fireplace. Yeah, somewhere in the, with the chimney structure. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, well, with the, with the uh, property, the Allen's Park property, there was a fire in 2011. It was a, uh, it related to the chimney. And I'm certainly half here. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm concerned with the uh, wastewater treatment, septic, and then the leaks field. Does that go downstream? Our wastewater man. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. In, in terms of that, we're working with a company called AMEC Engineering, uh, who will be designing that system and looking. They're also the ones drilling the wells. Um, and uh, basically, in terms of not affecting the downstream water, that's why they've identified this particular preliminarily until they do all the rest of the perk testing and their geotechnical testing to make sure that we're not affecting people downstream. So we're not done yet. We, uh, we, we think this is the best place, but we haven't, again, can't get the truck across the river. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so we're looking at the line. It's all Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. Just a, just a quick related issue here, too. Uh, I've been working with uh, our, our caretaker on the property, Justin Morris, and he's been work, talking with the water commissioner. Uh, the pond that we have, with the pond, here it is. Um, had been down uh, quite a bit. It had a problem with the uh, the overflow being broken. It's been repaired, and um, with the water commissioner's uh, input, he's been cleaning out the ditch that goes into the pond. And um, at, at his recommendation, um, we will uh, probably within sometime this fall be bringing a small mini excavator in to continue to clean out the ditch. It goes to that pond. So just just so you understand, you may see a piece of equipment out there. It has nothing to do with the rezoning. It has to do with the the pond maintenance, which uh, the water commissioner uh, told us we needed to work on. Back in the back there. Yes, um, since you're going to have people being there overnight, what is the plans for uh, the staff being there? Are there people there constantly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Now, what are the plans for the staff? Yeah, the, the uh, requirements, uh, I have to talk with, with uh, our, our legal people here, but uh, my understanding from the retreats that I ran before, when I had uh, any uh, outside uh, non-employees on the grounds, we had to have a staff member on the grounds. Okay. So, uh, and, and to that regard, uh, if you see a light on the cabin tonight, that's me. <laughs> Will there be somebody there resident at all times? Not necessarily resident at all times, when we have anyone using the place. And there would be the staff uh, on site. So if anybody wants to see me tomorrow morning for more questions that we can handle tonight, I will be at the DW's at staff. <laughs> I think this is more for everybody instead of addressing to you. If this was, if you guys didn't purchase it, and it would have went to residential, you would have homeowners sleeping there every night taking residences. You have, we all have individual wells, we all have individual septics, we all have individual reach pieces. So I'm thinking, you know, a few people stay all right, a few, you know, two wells maybe at max, and one big leach field is better than 50 to 100 or... I, I also agree, I think this would be a great project. I've 
just had a few more questions about uh, kind of on the fire issue. Um, will, we, will there be fire hydrants in place? Uh, will there be sprinkler buildings? And also, are there any plans for fire breaks with the school of approximately 400 kids on the west? Well, for the first part of that question, um, everything's going to be required to, all the buildable structures are going to be either non-combustible or have to be sprinkled. Um, the fire chief is very aware of the fire danger of the site and how it can mitigate that. When you look at the, with the break with the school, we're going to have many more requirements when we go through our site development plan process after this rezoning when we get detailed designs, what materials are we using, kind of all that stuff. And that'll be published on their website publicly for everyone to look at and comment. Um, anything else with regard to that? Oh, there will be fire hydrants. Um, we're not sure where those are going to be until we get those requirements from the county. The, the fire, hydrants, fire hydrants typically need to be within 150 feet of, of the buildings. And so we will be placing a number of fire hydrants around the area in terms of that. Uh, besides the the, the, uh, the sprinkler systems inside the buildings, um, and then again, um, you know, typically, if, if this was um, in, in Denver, we wouldn't have all of this fire fuel storage, but uh, um, we will have. And again, that's a preliminary number based on the type of construction and the square footage and the, and the occupant use and such. But uh, like I said, preliminarily. Um, with the, the occupancies that we've, we've identified, uh, our preliminary calculations indicate 270,000 gallons of, of, uh, of fire full storage and about 30,000 gallons of domestic storage, which will be you know, in the same tank. But So we'll, we'll, we'll eventually end up with a tank or tanks uh, that will accommodate that much fire full or that much water, which will, as I said before, the intention is to protect the buildings, but also there's a nice residual that will help slow down um, and help protect the rest of this whole residential area. Thank you. Yes, sir. With the protection of the uh, people in these wells that the drill, are they going to be any testing for uranium and stuff like that daily or weekly or anything like that? Or are you going to the, the, the water quality is a big deal um, in terms of uh, the usability of the water. Uh, not only all that good stuff that you just mentioned, but in terms of the amount of iron that's in the water, um, in terms of, in, in all of those kinds of things for water treatment. Um, iron can do some severe staining well, we to porcelain and all those kinds of things. Sure. I mean, we need to. There will be some uh, a considerable amount of testing um, once those once those wells are built. And I'm not sure if they've done any preliminary or not. Well, the engineer's initial assessment was there probably is uranium, some degree of water, depends on the quantity, concentration, which will determine what needs to be done. You know, you filter it out, collect it, and send it off. But they haven't gotten to because they haven't talked about it. I've been avoiding your thing. I apologize. Um, I have two questions. Number one, um, part of the reason why you're moving to this location is because the one in Alice Park, one of the major structures burned. Part of the reason it burned, according to the newspapers, was because there was lack of roads and lack of water. Or could you see exactly that situation here? No. There was a 30,000 gallon tank for the entire facility there. Okay, but how will you get that tank? to the water in that tank, to the structure, the fire pressure. Oh, it'll all be piped to our underground system, um, in, in terms of that, with the generator, um, in terms of that, that's how it'll get there. A generator will be over. Well, I, no, I understand that. I mean, I mean, but the bottom line is, is that there was some power issues with the fire. Um, there's all, there were some freezing issues, you know, that happened. Uh, and up, up in that particular area, there were some things that happened um, so that they weren't able to get the water out of the tank in order to put out the fire. There were some issues along those lines. And again, um, hopefully, you know, I think we've learned some very valuable, unfortunately expensive uh, lessons with regard to that. We're going to be taking a lot of um, very, very cautious um, implementation here as we go forward with the development of this facility. Okay, so 
So my second question is, did you just walk from the one in Ellen's Park? Or what have you done with that? I mean, what kind of a neighborhood have you left that particular Do we need to um, the, the, essentially, we have not walked. The archdiocese still owns our property. Um, approximately half of that 165 ish acres is really undeveloped. The other is such a, such a steep slope that it's not really desirable. It has a historic chapel that was designed in 1935 by J.D. Benedict. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he's done a number of wonderful structures all over the front range in Littleton and um, a number of other churches in, in Denver and what have you. Um, and it's a historic structure. It's on the federal and the state historic registry. Um, we intend to maintain that facility, uh, improve it. It needs some maintenance work that will, that will be uh, taken into consideration. We're going to improve the accessibility to it. We're going to improve the parking to it. And there's another uh, small building there, St. Williams Lodge, that we will be renovating. And they used to use it as a crafts building um, for the kids when they were up there. We're going to be modifying that into a welcome center, uh, a, a his little historical heritage center, um, a place for uh, the, the bride and the groom to get ready because uh, they do a lot of weddings up there. And there just also happens to be this really cool little garage door in there. We're going to park there golf cart here and zip the bride over to the chapel. So yes, we intend to continue to use that facility. And, and, and there is, and we also will be redeveloping a hiking trail um, off to the side where it's safe um, and away from where the flow line comes down from Mount Maker. As well as we have too. We are, that portion that you said half of it has been destroyed. We actually are cleaning that up, planting grass, um, it's got wood chips on it and everything. So, right, yeah. right. Yeah, I don't want to I'll move along. I'll let you think about it. Go ahead, man. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is in regards to the pond. Is that going to be open to the public to fish from? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the, uh, the fishing regulations are in Colorado. Uh, but I would say that the answer is similar to the hiking trail answer. That, okay. uh, you know, it could be, come see me. Okay. And I have a second, second yes. question that. One of the big things is also the elk migration that comes down through that area. One of the biggest concerns is it looks like the road and also where the property is, that it's going to potentially change their migration through the Elk Creek area. What are you guys doing to help prevent any changes or some concerns with the animals changing their migration path? <laughs> I'm not an expert on animal migration. You want to do it? <laughs> Not, uh, not a wildlife expert by any means, and uh, there's 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 my helper back there. Well, I've just living there for over 20 years. The elk follow where the food source is, so they, they follow the water and the grass. And so I don't believe that there's any interference. I don't I don't know if you're going to close anything off or fence anything off, but there won't be any interference to the elk because the elk probably would go up. And They've just recently come back. Yeah. Yeah. They they are coming down the hill. Yeah, they that come trail. back and they sit there and they have hundreds right at Cedar Circle. Right. I live at Cedar Circle and I'm in house in the corner and I would like you to readdress the traffic problem. Are you going to have turn lanes? That's a bus stop. So I'm concerned about children getting on and off the bus in the morning. And the other thing is, is that you're building this big tank. And while I appreciate the additional water, I didn't buy my home out there and invest savings and everything else to look at tanks. Well, we, we, we don't want to disrupt that view either. And so those tanks are going to be, you know, partially buried into the ground. They're going to be, we're trying to find areas where we can uh, hide them in terms of, so they're not viewed from any areas. You know, in terms of that, if I if I submerge the tanks, they're less likely to uh, freeze with that whole situation. So we are not interested in looking at a tank any more than you are looking at a tank. So um, we will we will definitely be looking at that. Again, from we're going to be working with the county with regard to this, um, and, and the school districts and such in terms of you know safety for children. 
and this is going to be a big deal, we realize that that, that intersection is in a very, very important piece. We, um, we have, uh, we, we, we've noticed people driving up and down that, you know, over the speed limit um, in this area. Um, Outside of you know a Catholic group that's outside that would love to come stay there that we would allow them to stay there. So Next thing just, it's just real quick on that program wise too. Occasionally you do have somebody who is a who's a speaker that, that I wanted to go listen to and I'm two states away. So you may have a few people who would come in, but uh, by and large you're going to have people who are going to be able to drive there within a couple hours time. So it's going to be very much within the state. Okay. The question. question was um, concerning the children coming. You refer to schools and high schoolers and so forth. Are those public schools? Are those private Catholic schools? Primarily Catholic schools. Uh, it's, it's not impossible that we could have a, uh, you know, a, a group 
grew to a public school want to use the place. But um, you know, it's it's a religious retreat, so anybody who wanted to become has to has to have some kind of, of an affinity with that. Okay. And then the last question is sort of a combined question: Is what are the buildings going to look like? Are they going to look like a hotel? Or are they going to look like a creative <laughs> lodge? And the last piece of that is: Why do you need campsites? You know, the okay, the building. Uh, I don't know. Um, other than I can tell you that, uh, as I said before, we haven't designed the buildings yet. We have, we have uh, got some preliminary programs in terms of the spaces and the sizes and the relationships of those spaces. Um, and, uh, and, and that's as far as we've gone. Now, our intention is that, uh, again, because this is a retreat center, and we're trying to kind of commune with nature, you know. So it's going. We're going to be using an awful lot of natural materials um, and to blend in with nature. But and but we haven't gotten to that point. And as part of this process that we go through with the county, we will be designing those buildings once we get past the rezoning, and then we will essentially uh, be uh, submitting those to the county for review, and then and they will essentially be you know, for review again uh, at that particular time, so you'll be able to get a sense of what direction we're at. But we're looking at, you know, that very natural materials, natural earth tone colors, you know, essentially uh, with the intention of blending in with the environment. And to reinforce that, the Archbishop himself hated the old Camp St. Malo and the look of it, because it looked like, he said it looked like a Ramada Inn. <laughs> so he said it's not going to look like a Ramada Inn. Your cab crowds. Your turn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just, just one thing to point to, we have a very successful program uh, called Outdoor Lab, uh, which is, is targeted to the, uh, the parochial schools. I don't remember what grade they, they actually were, sixth grade. Um, and uh, one of the ideas is we might be able to find, a, uh, to again, work with the organization within the, the archdiocese that runs that. They used to do things at, at uh, St. Paulo. Uh, and we've been, Part of the, the idea here is we'd be able to do this in our own place again, rather than having them out in another property. Why do you camping as opposed to in a building? Well, because the program is an outdoor program. Outdoor lab is very, very, uh, very uh, working with, with, uh, with, uh, with nature, so they need to be in, in a nature setting. You, in the you're, very back. you're looking for, for putting up yurts rather than bringing in tents and things. Yes, yes, there, there so are, you they are, I don't know if you call it, any tents 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 structures. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess living really close within 500 feet of that development, is, or even less, is uh, one of the things that puts us on high alert, especially in summer and drought conditions, is smoke. We get a light and storm come over, uh, sometimes we get dry light. And so anytime we smell smoke, you know, we can call the county right away. And so that is my concern, is being so close to campground, we really get um, concerned about smelling smoke, especially if we have open yeah. windows to keep our home and, 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 and I think campground is not the, the right term to use, it's camping area, again, with, with a, a small number of yurts uh, and, and probably a central campfire. The, the other question I had too was uh, one of the things that I've noticed on the property is because we've had a really wet summer is we have a lot of uh, uh, not just weeds on the property right now and the big concern from a long term point of view is the herbicide the county uses. Um, I was told by the expert from the county was it's related to Agent Orange. It's an orange container and the people dress in hazmat suits when they come down to spray. And um, what we've noticed living there is if we can cut those weeds down and keep them down before they go to seed, that's probably the best best approach to minimize the herbicide usage. And so I was uh, actually happy that someone's going to be there and maintain the property. Uh, if you're not going to have the cows there, then I'm not sure um, you know the weed control will have to be some kind of uh, program. So it just makes sense to try to get a group of volunteers together where you have to do weed detail. I'll be out there with you. <laughs> Let me plan that there's gonna, there has to be a forest management plan for that whole site once we rezone, so that some that's not currently there they don't have. We're not that site's not required to have a management plan, so we got to work with the national forestry and a forestry consultant on managing that whole site as a whole, weeds, trees, fire danger, everything. 
um, and that will be that will be throughout the whole ownership of the site. So it's going to be a year-to-year -year process. John, get this lady right here before our own phone. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't see it. Um, the fact that the topic issue is uh, CDOT going to be brought in as consulting uh, with that dangerous intersection change crossing with all this Yeah, again, we can definitely, this doesn't access directly up to Nephi, but that's how we access it. But yeah. yeah, so we can refer to CDOT, and I think even if I don't, as like the case manager, transportation engineering works closely with CDOT on that, but I will make sure that that is a referral agency as well. Okay, and then an ancillary of that, when McLaughlin, Chief McLaughlin, will he be brought in for, for example, exit plans for wildfire? Yes, he's already been okay. heavily involved in it, and he, his concerns are, are echoed here tonight, so. Let's get her over here. Actually, these people have their hands up over. Okay. Yeah, let's get okay. over. Let's have them collaborate on this. From the county standpoint, what's the possibility of uh, a portion of this being subdivided on the road? Could you repeat your question? Uh, so I think he had some questions about what what the other potential, if if this rezoning doesn't go through, what other potential uses could be there? Or? Uh, well, given your master plan, could this could the Catholic Church someday subdivide a portion of this by two and five for commercial use? Um, the community plan wouldn't support that use. Um, I can never say that. that <laughs> right, exactly. But the community plan updates our public processes, and and so as of right now. The community plan there recommends residential uses. It doesn't allow for any commercial uses on there. The only way that the community plan is supporting this use is that there, there are overarching kind of goals and areas that we would locate this type of very specific <coughs> retreat center, and this is one of them. Um, did you have a follow-up to that? I have a follow-up to that. I sold the property that is now the swim park. Okay. Prior to that, it was a PUD plan. And they went back to mining okay. prior to that, but there could have been a commercial uh, site at that point. Yeah, so basically up in, up in the Conifer area, if you're familiar with the activity centers identified, those are really the only areas within Conifer that are identified as potential commercial. Now, that doesn't mean that that could never happen. Crazier things have happened in the county. Um, staff bases their recommendation on the comprehensive plan and compatibility of the use of the surrounding land uses. So if you were asking me today, if you were coming in for a pre-op saying I want to do commercial here, I'd say staff does not support that. You could say, I don't care, I'm going to hearing, and your elected board and county com commissioners could potentially prove something like that. So I'll never say never, but very unlikely, and staff as well as the community plan does not support commercial there. That answer? Looks like you know each other, but we're going to do that. Designated place, and you have you know, the 
the clear area. And those folks are just like. Yeah, you mentioned that you're going to have weddings up there, right? It is possible. It is, it is a chapel. You could have weddings. And you have weddings, and obviously, not everybody is coming to the wedding is part of being a tree group on the outside is coming to the Correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then you'll have a reception. It was a Disney issue, but it is possible, yeah. If you have a reception, it's going to be out there. Yes, it's something that we have to look at. And how are you going to handle alcohol and beverages being served? Well, typically what you do is you bring in an outside caterer who has a, a, a bartender with a permit. Right, so you have to have a special liquor license. You're going through the licensing procedure. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Or no? You're talking about the outside. He's talking about the it's, one outside. It's off of Douglas. It's, it's actually, you access it off of the Highway 285 front of It's not on the so you don't own all the way to the Highway 285 frontage road? We only own the Henley Red Line. So this is our property line. That little tiny So we. Uh, we're not, uh, we're not, we're not uh, an easement, um, you know, and we're certainly more than happy to talk to somebody about easements, but uh, at, at this stage of the game, um, we don't have the right to do that. Uh, right here, you mean? Yeah, in terms of... Again, we don't, we don't have, we don't... And again, we're, 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 we're going to be investigating in a lot of options here in terms of where we can go and what's the most economical way to go. Because if i got to go from here to here, it may be less money for me to do a bunch of switchbacks to get it into some, some other location. Yes, sir. We, we intend we intend to abandon this, okay? And um, we essentially will have one intersection, um, which will tie with um, create creating an intersection with South Cedar Circle, <coughs> creating a new bridge, and then this little gray or brown little area here will be our our access back to that cabin. Yes, sir. Yes, what's yeah. your time frame now? Here's almost the fall of 2015, so just in the process of just sort of normal and normal. There's no way to actually do it. When we have here, first of all, in the matter of destruction, I believe it is, et cetera. My Allison said 12. Months we were kind of open for 12 days. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, so it's going to take us, you know, that amount of time to get through the planning department. Um, and uh, so at, at that stage of the game, then then we have to go into production for construction drawings. There'll be a number of months with regard to that, and then it'll, it'll probably take um, probably. Uh, I'm going to guess 18 to 20 months to actually build the building. So we'll be in we'll be in that kind of a venue in terms of that in terms of timing. So it's those are rough numbers. Yeah, it's going to be in the three before we're occupying. Yes, ma'am. As far as, as, far as uh, phasing goes, okay. essentially at this stage of the game, we intend to build a retreat center first. Along with the retreat center will, will come the infrastructure in terms of the roads, the secondary exit, the domestic water components, and the parking lot to, to essentially um, accommodate the, uh, the retreat center. The next piece of that after that from a funding standpoint, would be the chapel. The third third area um, would then be the retreat center. Um, and at that time, uh, I'm sorry, what did I say? The youth retreat center. Um, and, uh, and, and at that time, we're kind of hoping that along with this, we can kind of finish up the rest of the development at that stage. For as far as timing goes, um, that, that has not been established other than we, that, that first construction that we talked about will focus on the adult retreat center and the infrastructure.
Uh, at this stage of the game, based on this, 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 um, the Archbishop and the administration within the Arch Archdiocese, this is what has been planned, period. Um, so, I mean, I, uh, there could be changes down the road, but at this stage of the game, we, this is our understanding of, of the master plan. to say to any future development, whether it's a new building or an addition to any structure, would go through another process with the county, which is a public process. So you'll be aware um, of any changes to that. And also, the rezoning process has to lay out any potential in use that they would want. So if the zoning got approved and they built this and they came back and said, we're going to put, we want to do a gas station, the zoning wouldn't allow that. They have to go through a rezoning and this whole process all over again, which likely would not be go through. So. Good. Um, what is the challenge for regulations on the number of parking spaces required for this type of occupancy based on the number of maximum number of workers? So we know about what size that parking lot is. Um, so, I can't give you a number right off the top of my head. What happens is they come in with their planned development. They're going to do provide us with a, a study of how much parking, a parking study, based on their occupancy and how much parking they think they need to have. Then what we do is we look at other examples of a similar type use and compare that. We look at, you know, if we know of another center like this that is under park, we use that to evaluate their parking. Um, and again, that'll be through the rezoning, so that'll be a public process as well. Based on the uh, plan that uh, Allison just approved, um, <laughs> with, with the following assumptions, um, with the following assumptions, for instance, um, one parking stall for every thousand square feet in the uh, uh, adult retreat center, 47 stalls, one parking stall for every three seats in the chapel, 53, the youth center at 1,000, again, 12, uh, one for each of the hermitages and, and one, one for each of the, uh, the little um, yurt buildings, we'd be at 120 parking stalls. That would be uh, some of the standards that the county typically has that we would be investigating and looking at, but that would kind of be in their general ballpark. And if you could sign this. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's an interesting question um, because there's been some, some people have talked to me tonight about the fencing and where we're going to put the fencing and how we're going to control things and we want to take a look at fencing um, but at the same time I think one of the things that's important is for us to understand some of the wildlife um, migration through the area. We'll be working with the Forest Service uh, with regard to that so we want to make sure that we're doing a safe um, fencing component um, we're, we're able to control uh, people coming and going off the site, um, but at the same time, we, we want to make sure that we're able to get um, the wildlife uh, uh, on and off the site. Again, that's part of the or part of the whole reason for having this facility is to be able to commune with ma nature. They want to be, you know, um, having those breathtaking moments when a you know herd of moose go through. <laughs> He doesn't live up here, obviously. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, <laughs> all I can be more than that. Uh -huh. Do you have an example of what, were you within the setbacks or accessory square footage or well, do you have the reasoning why you were denied or? You know, in some cases it was, um, you know, well you might be a little too close to this other property or you might have to, you know, build up something on the side or, you know, it, was just, it hasn't just been us. I mean, it's been two previous owners of our property were also denied, which we didn't know which was. Mm -hmm. Setbacks are one of them. Yeah. Yeah, and I can, I'd be happy to talk with you about your each individual properties. All I can say is that when they go through their rezoning, they're going to have a same set of restrictions and requirements that were developed by them but approved by the county, just like your property has. So your property has zoning requirements that when you purchase the property, you knew what the zoning was on there, you knew what the setbacks, the height, what you could do on that property are. This site is going to have its own set that is approved by the county of, of same kind of restrictions. So if we put a restriction that says you can't have a 12-foot fence in the zoning and they come and ask for a 12-foot fence, we, we fall back to the zoning, the, re the restrictions that were put in place. So um, unfortunately, that's, that's the best answer I can give. We had uh, scheduled this for two hours, and it's about, I'm not sure exact time, it's 7.55 according to that clock. I'll get to you in a second. Or before, I took more questions, because we're, we're actually can hang around for a little bit, too, if you want to come up and, and ask us questions. It's one thing about this whole process. We, we do want to hear your input. I mean, we want this place to be what you guys want it to be, which is beautiful, you know, wildlife, et cetera. So we want to continue to hear and communicate with you. But I wanted to say thank Father Tim and, and the parish for the use of this facility. Um, he, he did this for us and showed it. Sure it was, so. I can go to your question again. this week somewhere else. <laughs> <I'm saying. laughs> but yeah, he had, he's been very involved in the whole process. Well, if, if that is, is all, I think we've had our, our two hours. And thank you so much for coming out. And, and, uh, Thank you.